Okay, hello. Thank you everyone for joining us today to hear some of the top challenges and priorities for service desks in 2020. And these were actually laid out in the View from the Frontline report, which was produced by SDI. Um, and if you're interested, that can be found in the insight area of the SDI website. Uh, we're also going to hear from Patrick Bolger from Hornbill today to talk about some of the innovations to address these challenges. Uh, and we'll also hear Darren Rose at Vinci Construction um, who will explain how to apply these innovations and change the perception of how IT delivers business and value. So I mentioned that we'll be using some SDI Insight during this webinar, and that is what we have on screen here. Um, so we can see where service desks spent most of their time in 2019 um, and what causes service desk professionals the most pain on a daily basis. So I'll just go through some of the main points. Um, so firstly, service desks are still spending the majority of their time firefighting due to a heavy workload. Um, and this has actually been probably one of the uh, the main time sucks, as it were, of uh, that we've seen in this report for the entire time that we've been doing it. Uh, secondly, the main cause of pain for service desks in 2017 was a lack of budget and resources to help meet business expectations. Um, although this pain area has actually decreased from 60% to 44%, which is quite promising. Um, and the most common pain area for service desk professionals is the inability to produce uh, metric reports easily. And we can see that the proportion of professionals struggling with this has almost doubled since 2017. A separate question showed that the tool usability and function is the most common tool related frustration for service desk professionals. And we can also see that tools being out of date, out of the box readiness and vendor support are also more frequently cited as frustrations rather than benefits. And the most common uh, priorities for service desks over the next 12 months are using more automation, increasing value to the business and increasing service desk performance. I've cherry picked the stats that I've showed you to be in line with what Pat and Darren are going to be talking about in just a few moments. So the main points will center around heavy workload and how you can mitigate uh, some of the issues around that, how you can meet increasing business demand for service, ways in which you can make your metrics work for you, addressing some of those tool and vendor frustrations, looking at the rising adoption of uh, SaaS and merging of cloud and on-premise software, and finally taking a deeper look at those 2020 priorities. Um, so that's my little introduction of her. So we should have Pat and Darren on the line. Ah, hello, you've unmuted me, Scarlett. That's fantastic. <laughs> <laughs> Wonderful. Good morning, everyone. It's Darren here as well. And I think you're going to let me drive. Is that correct? <laughs> yep, it's all over to you now. Okay, fair enough. So you, you've already done the intros, but there's a, a few um, contact bits of information there. So if people want to get in touch with us, uh, there's a few Twitter links, et cetera. So yeah, thanks for that intro. Um, that's certainly stuff that we're finding in, in, in terms of heavy workload. Um, service desks are really struggling to cope with the amount of stuff that's, that's coming their way. Um, and it's no small wonder because uh, as this kind of diagram shows, uh, what we're doing is incredibly complex. It really is. Um, not only do we have to keep all this stuff running, um, we've got to add new stuff to it, retire old stuff and um, innovate at the same time and deliver business value. So it's, it's actually quite a challenge. But I think for uh, the vast majority of IT organizations, um, possibly not the service desk, but certainly second and third line support staff, one of the things that we tend to ignore is the other work that actually comes in just outside of the service desk. And, and by that, I mean uh, operations and projects largely sharing the same resources. So you've got this kind of constant tug of war that's going on. Um, and then when you have a business critical project, um, service suffers because you've got staff taken away from positions that service de the service desk team are relying on to maintain service availability and kind of improve things. Uh, and at the same time, uh, if you've got projects going on, you know, a critical service outage is going to suck people away from that to basically deal with that. So um, you get this constant kind of tug of war in terms of resources. But also one of the key points is, is poor governance of, uh, of projects. Um, you tend to find that actually 
projects get raised and get executed and a lot of them don't get completed but uh, you you have because of that poor governance you've got low value work getting in the way of kind of high value work stuff that a business needs to achieve to actually meet its goals and one of the key challenges with that is that um, there's no holistic view of what's actually going on in terms of that resource demand and availability. So um, you, you've got in many organizations, project managers who kind of, what they do is temporary, you know, they, they need resources for a period of time, then it gets closed down, they move on to something else. But there's lots of work going on and it's really impossible for people to manage that across different silos. So from a service management perspective, if your tool supports it um, or if it can in integrate with something else, having that kind of project management capability alongside your service management capability is a, it, it's a godsend, it really is. Um, so what I'll do is I'll bring Darren in on this one because this is something that they've done at Vinci. And uh, Darren, do you wanna explain what you've done? Yeah, certainly. Thank you for the intro, Pat, and thank you, Charlotte. Uh, Scarlett, we um, we've been using the Hornbill for a while now, mostly for service management, so the traditional service desk tool. Um, but then we actually took on the project manager module uh, last year, um, and so what we were trying to do ourselves was to create this this one view, so this one system for workers. I kind of coined it with Patrick before, um, and it was the aim was to try and give us complete visibility of the project and service work. Uh, like many other departments, I'm sure. Um, our resources are shared across project and operational activities, uh, and we were having a real struggle to try and understand what the true demand was on our teams. And what we did was we were able to bring in project manager to work alongside service manager, and we were then able to amalgamate all of our tasks, all of our work, so we have our projects, we have our tickets, we have our change requests, everything on a single platform. What this enabled us to do was then actually see what the total demand was, who was supposed to be working on what, and it also then mainly gave us the chance to actually prioritise that work. Um, the governance aspect though was really key. So we created a system internally where people could submit a simple service request where they would request a new project. That instantly came into our project review team and the IT management board to then see, okay, what's the priority of this? Does it align to the business strategies and tactics or is it a single point solution that actually doesn't really add much value overall? And what we were then able to do was actually make sure we could balance the workload better between our projects and our service work and that the projects we were delivering were actually adding the value back to the business that they were supposed to be doing and it really just stopped some of our key resources working on small projects sometimes which were nice to do's um, we often get drawn into those kind of things that's like sounds like a challenge I could do that and you get stuck in but actually it wasn't really a priority in terms of the business planning so what we now do is we actually use Project Manager to give us this, this one system to view everything. It allows us to coordinate our weekly scrum meetings where we can look at who's doing what, what's their outstanding service demand, as well as what projects are they supposed to be working on. And it's actually making us um, far more efficient and a lot easier to manage our operational work alongside our project work. Okay, Darren, thank you for that. I know we'll we'll get on to a little bit more of some of the stuff that you are doing because there's some really clever stuff happening behind the scenes with that. So uh, we'll mention that a little bit later. But I just wanted to get on to this kind of heavy workload for the service desk. Um, it's a major challenge. I mean, that's what it feels like working on a service desk. Actually, I, I almost included a video in this. Uh, I don't know if you've seen the gag, but the guy actually um, shampooing under a shower and someone else pouring more shampoo under their head as they're doing it, I think. That, that's what it often feels like to work in the service desk. And I think the challenge there is actually, what are you working on? So for most service desks, I think this is true, that they're drowning in what we call low value interactions. So this is stuff that really the customer would rather not be calling up about and the service desk would rather not be receiving. Um, and it's this type of password resets, you know, joiners, levers, account updates, uh, common problems. Um, we'll say connectivity issues, problems with performance of machines, that type of thing, and of course, recurring incidents. And the challenge with that is that basically it's first in, first out. So the service desk is dealing with stuff in the order it comes in. Of course, you're trying to attach an urgency and uh, an impact um, kind of assessment to that. But uh, essentially, um, once you're dealing with lots and lots of phone calls, it's really, really difficult to actually prioritize what you're doing. 
And there's a little graph here on the right hand side I've used many a time, which is basically just saying that the, the way to, to consider this is if you look at the number of requests you got over the last little while, and you look at stuff that's just a pain for both the service desk and for the customer, things like bugs in software, common connectivity problems, really root cause analysis, you're looking to eliminate that type of stuff. There are things that um, are value to IT, um, um, but not so much value to the customer. Um, let's say simple stuff like, um, let's say, what's the asset you currently call from? Well, well actually, yeah, assigning that asset, there's a simple way to actually address that. We'll, we'll show you some of that as you go along, um, so that you're not asking the customer that question, you're just uh, improving your operations. Then um, on the right-hand side over here, um, you've got the uh, ability to kind of do stuff like your joiners, levers, updates, and things like that. This really are key targets for automation. You're simply looking to, to automate some of that away. And again, we'll, we'll look at a little bit of that later. Um, on the top right, this is basically the, the important stuff, the things where you should actually be spending your time. Uh, and if you can focus more on moving up to that top right, that really is going to pay major benefits. Uh, of course, the problem with eliminating stuff is that um, for many service tests, there's very little problem management going on. So what tends to happen is that people get used to implementing workarounds. Uh, problem management is left up to second or third line functions who've got a growing list of business as usual and incidents that they're supporting. So the, the problem queue gets bigger. Um, so I would say that really, if, if, if your business is not prepared to appoint kind of dedicated resource to problem management, you're probably not ready for it. And, and it, it is really that simple. Of course, the other key challenge is, um, and I think it has improved, and Scarlett's, um, uh, that, that report she was looking at was basically saying so service adoption, people are not struggling as much to, uh, to actually deliver serve service. But certainly it's, it's, it's been my experience that actually largely self service initiatives uh, are driven by the need to reduce uh, support costs, increase the efficiency of operations, that type of thing. But they're driven by IT and not by the customer and not to improve the service experience. And it's certainly worth doing because as Gartner says here, an organization that takes 300,000 contacts a year, you can drive 20% of that self-service will see a saving of between three and $450,000. And it works, there's no question it works. So Darren, although you guys are, are using self-service quite, uh, quite a lot, so do you wanna just take us through the benefits or the, the, the how self-service actually helps? Yeah, so um, we've been really keen to push the, the, the self-service portal within Vinci, um, even more so now as we've kind of brought on other teams um, outside of IT. But the initial thing for us really was to provide our, our users with um, a couple of key features that we found really useful. The first was updates. Um, the user being able to see what their latest update is on their ticket, who it's assigned to, what stages are still left to complete, et cetera. We were getting about 20% of our call volume into our service list was just to check status. Once we put in self-service, we've seen that drop down to about 2%. So just in terms of inbound calls coming in that we keep talking about low value activities, people checking their status and phoning in for a status update is what we would consider right at the bottom of the pile in terms of low value. So being able to displace that by making sure we did the self-service portal was a real bonus for us. The other one was the FAQs. Um, which provided us with, again, just a single place for people to go. Um, we were able to consolidate sort of two or three other systems that we had that had FAQs on it. People didn't know if they went to the network drive, our intranet or our other sort of business process system. And actually what we were able to do is just point them to one place. From there, we will then signpost them around the rest of the company systems if we need to. But it's really helped with just being able to consolidate all of that information and give them fixed information up front also just make sure they end up going to the right place and getting the right information if they need it. What we've also really been able to do is um, reduce the number of times things like tickets get reassigned. I think that for us has been a real key because rather than using the service desk as a bottleneck, by making sure we set up the service request correctly on the portal, tickets are getting reassigned directly into the right team based on the information provided by the end user. That's really sped up the, the overall life cycle of the ticket because we're removing bottlenecks where tickets just sometimes wait to get reassigned to the right team. So that's been really key for us in terms of just improving not only our efficiency within IT, but from an end user point of view, the total lifetime that their ticket takes. The other thing we're also able to do is just really around setting the expectations. 
and for people to know, and this kind of falls into the update element, but just for people to know what's going on and also to be able to explain the process to them so that the number of times we would get emails, for example, and this is where self-service has been one of our big drivers is we, I want to turn email off would be my goal. I'm not going to get there quite yet. I'd love to be able to turn off an email function to support the IT support team um, because people email in, they're emailing with half the information, not correct information. It's actually by sending them to the portal, we improve the overall quality of our tickets. We can ask for the right information. We can make sure fields are validated so that people, if they're asked to supply a number, they actually supply a number. Um, and it just means that the quality, the overall quality of all of our tickets increases. And that again, we can ask things up front to get the right information and that all helps reduce the overall life cycle of those tickets and ultimately improves the productivity of the workforce because they're not wasting time rechasing information sending us new stuff and actually getting things right first time fantastic good stuff so what i want to do is just basically take you through now a, a, a basic kind of idea of kind of laying out self service what i think might be important elements so this is just your average self service portal so you got things like your favorite services uh, just make it more accessible also just seeing stuff that's impacted um seeing your requests um really important as darren just mentioned and the ability to kind of filter will say just basically all my services or maybe i'm just interested in it services uh, and once I go into the service I'm looking at, this is my home working service. Um, I can see here that uh, there are FAQs that are presented. You know, how do I resolve um, common VPN problems? I can just play a video or whatever. No issues. If we know there's a problem with connections, broadcast it to people and allow them to just basically say, hey, this affects me too. Um, but if we go through the process of making a request, this is the important thing to think about your service, to ask the right questions. So what's the problem with VPN? Connections being refused. Well, can you try these things and see if that will actually help you out? You're prompting them to do the right stuff. So, no, I've still got a problem. Uh, next, uh, well, you know, are you getting any of these error messages? And I've reviewed the knowledge, but I, I still can't connect. So, in usual form, I'll provide some fantastic information, as Darren said. Uh, connections being refused. And here, just the ability to link the asset I'm, I'm um, reporting on. Uh, and there we go. So now we can see, actually, here's the incident. You'll see that's been ticked already, the email confirmation. The questions have been asked um, during that process and the assets, all of that's there. Um, and that's just a, a really straightforward way of just basically in a few clicks providing all of that information that we were talking about a little bit earlier. So I want to come on to metrics because um, basically, it's, I would say probably the most common reason we are told that people want to change the service is they can't get decent reporting information from the solution. Now that is sometimes relevant in terms of there's a lot of kind of stuff you need to do at the back end. We'll say you need to know your SQL queries and join tables, all that type of thing. But I do think that in the vast majority of cases, um, people don't know what they want from the tools. And I use this image here because basically it's, uh, you know, I've got all my measurements here to uh, allow me to drive and to drive correctly. But this is not going to make me a better driver. It's that simple. So the point being that when you're looking at uh, metrics themselves, is that the whole Lightel mantra of adopt, adapt, improve. And what I mean by that is just, yeah, by all means, if the tool contains a whole heap of reports that are going to be useful for you, adopt them. Uh, if your best practice does it, adopt stuff from best practice, but it has to be adapted to fit your business. So there's some key questions, because um, I think we produce an awful lot of reports that probably are not really action. So a good indicator of that is if someone's not calling you to discuss the metrics that you just provided to, uh, provided to them, then they're probably not using them. So the big, first big question is, why do we need this metric? Second one is who's going to be receiving the information and what will they be using it for? So that's really, really important because that's what's going to drive the decision. So then you need to consider, is it easy if it collect that data? Um, which decision does it support or what does it not tell you as well as tell you? That's really key when you're looking at your metric stuff. And I think the other thing is that we establish metrics and then we just leave them sitting there. And I don't think that that's adequate because we could be should be continually reviewing, are we getting the right information to support the right decisions? And the focus needs to be on things that matter most to customers. You know, customers don't care possibly how many incidents you've logged. It is an important metric for the service desk to 
kind of say we, we we need more resources, we've got enough resources, whatever. But another thing I think that doesn't happen very often at all is uh, tying those measures to business objectives. And I think that's why we struggle to demonstrate value. So when you're looking at tools, I think the key things are you're looking for simplicity in terms of how you get those metrics and flexibility and how you produce them and visual management. I'll come on and explain what that is as we go through um, some of the stuff I think you're going to be looking for in tools. So we do the same thing here. We just uh, got our request list. This is typically what you'd see on the average service desk and it's a big old list. Um, so there are ways that you can go into that and say, actually, I'm only interested in seeing problems. Um, so that will filter down your list a little bit more. It's great. Go back to all our services here and just basically what I can then do is to say, actually, I only want the second line stuff. So these views allow you to filter that volume of information. Um, but again, if we go in here, you can also do things like on your views, uh, say, actually, I only want high priority instances. This is where the flexibility comes in. So if I want to say, actually, I don't need a SQL statement, but I just want to add a condition. I want to know stuff that's been kind of raised within the last seven or 30 days or whatever it is, just the ability to do that. Decide which columns you want to include in your um, in your metrics, um, which charts you'd like to use. So yeah, choose the existing charts, create a new chart, that type of thing. Then the ability to share that view with another team. That's quite a, a solid thing to be able to do. Because once you've done that, you can just basically go into your views and say, actually, I just want all high priority incidents, and that will bring your list down even further. So one of the key things with this visual management piece is the ability to switch that into a, a graphical view. So these are just what we call widgets. So you can kind of drag them around and place them in, in other locations, lay them out according to your needs on the service desk or for yourself or for different teams. But now if I want to see high priority stuff sent to second line, it's literally just a case of, case of clicking in here. So that visual management piece I think is incredibly important. So if we look at some of the other stuff as to how you might report this kind of on a more global level. So if we go in here and just basically we're accessing the um, the back end of the tool now to look at some of the uh, reporting capabilities. So if we go into applications, the one I'm interested in here is Hornbill Service Manager. And we go in and just basically say, I want advanced analytics. So what we do is we put together things like measures. So these are kind of common things like, you know, the number of incidents you might log in a month, that type of thing. And then you just got the stats and it's collected once a month, so 12 counts. And then you got thresholds, which means it turns green, amber or red, depending on what you're looking at. But the key thing is rolling these up into widgets. So this widgets um, is just basically a collection of little graphs. So if I want to see an annual comparison of the tickets we raise each month, it's there. But that in itself then needs to be brought into what we call a dashboard. So here we just got a, a dashboard for service desk overview. We're into that, there's your dashboard. And the clever thing here in terms of visibility is basically the ability to string these together in what we call a slideshow. So in this case, we include a number of dashboards. We just hit play. And this is the type of thing that would sit above your service desk or in other areas of your office to say, this is how we're performing over a given period of time. Uh, these are our metrics. And you display these for everyone to see. And I think that makes a substantial difference in terms of um, your visibility and explaining the problems you've got and where you're doing well or where you're not doing so well. Um, one of our customers, uh, Frederick from Crown, is just basically saying, you know, we display these KPIs uh, in our head office. It makes a real impression with management so people know how we're doing. And I think that's the key thing is to basically let people know how you're doing, where improvements uh, need to be made, and your staff will react accordingly. Um, I just want to actually, before I go on to that, Darren, I'll go back to that previous slide. Yeah, you guys are using other stuff. So you're using, I know, some of this, but also using Power BI as well within your organization, which I think a lot of our customers are using. Yeah, so we use the uh, we use the views, so the lists and stuff you showed earlier. So we use that in our in the actual teams, and we kind of split our metrics into the traditional kind of leading and lagging metrics. So the leading metrics are the stuff that we put into the views because they're the things that people can actually 
do something about. Um, the lagging metrics is the stuff that's already happened, and that's where we use Power BI. So we actually extract the data from Hornbill Service Manager, build our own Power BI dashboards, and that sort of shows past performance, um, trending example over time, and that's the one that we share out into the business. So we don't need to give the business Hornbill access to be able to access that information. We can just publish it as part of our management suite of information reports, and they can go and check and they can see how our central service teams have done, any trends, whether it's going up and down in terms of volumes and our percentage against SLA and stuff. So using Power BI has actually been really useful for us and a really powerful tool to kind of bolt on the side of what we're doing within Hornbill. Yeah, we've got lots of customers using that. And also Tableau comes up quite a lot as well. So it's, uh, but it's, you know, it, it's useful because the service desk is only one stream of information. You might be doing calls from your ACD, it might be doing network stuff or whatever it is, but it's the ability to pull all that together in, in a, kind of combined set of metrics that you can share with people. That's the important piece. So Scarlett mentioned the frustration with uh, tools themselves. And um, I just put this together in, in terms of liquid expectations. And what I mean by that is basically people expect stuff just to work and to flow fairly effectively. So the days of spreadsheets on steroids is, um, is kind of long, well and truly over, I think. So simplicity is is where it's at and the ability to kind of ask questions of people. So the experience you looked at on self-service, that's kind of, I'd equate that to something like uh, if I go to an insurance company and I want um, travel or car or home insurance, you know, I don't fill in one form and then they figure out which one it is. I basically choose and then it drives me down a separate path. So that's what we call uh, progressive capture. Um, and when you bring that into the tool, it allows you to do stuff with this visual management thing, like the, the little process tracker, so it's the, the little green ticks at the top. It just gives you a, an immediate heads up as to what's actually going on, um, what stuff needs to be done. And you know this can be presented not only to analysts, but out to customers in its full or in a, a brief form. This to me is, um, it's it's critical. It's uh, basically an idea we stole direct from social media, the ability to just mention someone within a ticket. So if I'm, we'll say, working on something on the service desk and I've got a subject matter expert, I'd like their opinion on it, I just mention them within the ticket and you can see whether they're available or online or whatever. They'll get a notification, a little pop-up either on their mobile or on their desktop to say you're mentioned and they'll get the message that you actually sent to them. And that is critical. And again, Darren, something I know that you guys use as well. Yes, yeah, so we use that quite a lot, especially if it's an escalation. Um, yeah. And it, it's, it really helps us kind of bring the team together. And it's one of the collaborative functions of Hornbill that we do really uh, do really like and have found really useful. Yeah, it's, it's, it's a really easy way because you don't actually, it's a much more fluid way than having to transfer a ticket. And as you say, it introduces delays and stuff. Um, another thing that, again, it, it seems fairly minor, but you've got this concept of social ob objects within tools these days. So in the same way as I can follow someone on LinkedIn or on Twitter or whatever, I can follow an incident, I can follow a service request, I can follow whatever. So if it's a major incident, you, know, you may have several people following, the notifications then find you. And the, the concept of liking something. So what we see this used a lot is, you know, someone asks a question um, within a, a workspace, which is just a collaborative environment. Um, someone else, subject matter expert, maybe answers that. And then you got other people from IT going like, 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 like. And in the same kind of way as something like Quora, that stuff just rises to the top. And the, the beauty of that is that this is kind of tacit knowledge, the stuff that doesn't typically get written down in, in knowledge management documents. It's just basically know-how. And typically you can't track that, but if you're doing that in conversations, you can, and that makes uh, knowledge management a whole lot more effective. Really simple thing here, but the concept of the ability to just put rich media into uh, into your ticket timelines. So be that videos or document links or just graphics in this thing, it, it really is quite a powerful capability. Um, and finally, uh, it was uh, gamification was flagged as a big thing a while ago. I think it's had its day. But the ability to just say, hey, well done, you know, you work really hard to get that done. Um, and, and, and that's really a, quite a nice thing to have within the tool. Um, we move on again, because I, I talked a lot about visual management. So you can see here from a change management perspective, this is really kind of quite a useful thing to have. You can see what's happening in the planning, authorization, implementation, review phases. But that in itself, while it's useful, um, 
gets rolled up into, we'll say, when changes are coming into the organization, people will be assigned activities. So what you're looking at here on that board is like, it's like a Kanban board. So I can see what's in my incoming queue, what's been assessed, what's with CAB, what's been approved, what's out for release. And just one quick look at that will tell you exactly what's going on. Now, I was talking to, um, I think it was Greg Fellows at Great Ormond Street Hospital, who's a customer of ours, and he was saying that they used to have 15 to 20 people just holed up in a room for an hour and a half each week just discussing change. And since they started using these boards, uh, at the time, he said to me that, that, that the last meeting was done in 11 minutes flat because everything is just done there and then uh, before the actual meeting itself but now i've been informed by Haley, his uh, colleague that actually they don't really do too many cab meetings unless something something essential all of it gets managed through this um this kind of concept of collaborative workspace is incredibly powerful as well so the ability for you to just go out and post something out to a team have subject matter ex experts respond this the kind of the liking i mentioned earlier this is where this really comes into play so that's what you're looking for in terms of a tool, something that supports a kind of more collaborative effort, is highly visual, and gives you that level of agility. Um, SAS, um, Scarlett mentioned earlier that finally, in that um, view from the Frontline report last year, that SAS and hybrid ITSM has now overtaken on-premise, and uh, it's no small wonder. So what can you expect from SAS? Well, I pulled this these few stats from uh, a, a source down there, you'll see at the bottom underneath the graphics, but it's growing five times faster than traditional on-premise software. And, and in 2020, it's expected to account global apps, uh, so cloud apps are expected to account for 90% of all mobile traffic. According to this survey, about 38% of companies globally are already in the cloud, and they expect um, those companies, 73% of them to be running on entirely on SaaS by 2020. Um, so the SaaS market is expected to grow somewhere between 75 and 100 billion, according to which uh, things you look at. And it is no small wonder because it just removes so much headache um, in, in terms of the stuff you have to do to actually maintain and administer your applications. So one thing I would say to people looking at SaaS at the moment is do beware of cloud washing. So cloud washing is a, you've got two boxes there, real SaaS on the right and so SaaS, same old software as a service. So this is where people just basically package up their application, put it into a data center and allow you to rent it as opposed to, to buying it on, online. And some really decent questions you can ask to basically figure out is it a real SaaS or is it so SaaS? But you have to uh, you have to ask all of these. So if someone offers an on-premise uh, or, or hosted uh, and hosted versions of their solution, it probably is one of those kind of black boxes. Um, if the user interface is only available in a browser, it'll give you an indication that actually it probably is SaaS. If it's a thick client, well then it's definitely one of these so SaaS things. Key question: How often do you release new versions of the software? For Certainly for on-premise, you'll tend to find that vendors typically do about one, one release a year. Um, first generation SaaS tools, probably be one or two releases a year as well. I'll come on to that in a bit and explain what I mean by that. Um, a key, t key telling question, even for first generation SaaS tools, uh, people kind of do an awful lot of coding and stuff in the background. So it takes them off the kind of uh, the standard upgrade route. Um, and if you've not got 100% of customers on the same version, then it's not what I call a native cloud application. And the most important thing is how do you get this newly released functionality out to, functionality out to your teams? So in a, a true SaaS environment, that should just happen. Um, in the same way as I'm told that there's a new version of Facebook available, I click a button and it, and it gets done. That's, that's how it happens with cloud native SaaS. So just to kind of explain that so if we can ignore the traditional on-premise co-location and hosting what i'm looking at infrastructure as a service is basically the the bottom stuff in the dark blue is is basically this is what the provider does so in in infrastructure it's basically the network the data center the virtualization and you take care of everything else platform as a service it's they provide a little bit more you're looking after the application and the data or you might be building applications on it so you're building stuff there um, and with modern kind of cloud native solutions, actually the vendor does pretty much everything. All you, you care about is the data and maybe configuring the tool. 
there is, I would say, the first generation SaaS tools that I was talking about um, fall somewhere between the platform and the software thing. So there is an application, but the key telling aspect will be what do you have to do to customize it? Some of them will allow you to kind of drag stuff around and kind of reposition it, and they've got clause builders and things like that. But if you want to get into nitty gritty, then you know you're looking at writing code, and that's kind of uh, a madness in this day and age in terms of resources that will suck from your team. So we see a lot of this. Uh, congratulations on your go live, and it's completely understandable that you know after uh, implementing a solution, a new solution, people might want to celebrate, including the vendor. Um, so it's not unusual to see a congratulations on your go live cake. A lot of people do it, but this I think is wrong. Completed your your upgrade. Um, <laughs> And literally, I have heard horror stories of things taking kind of literally six, eight weeks or even longer to actually just do an upgrade on a service management tool. And that's kind of madness. It just shouldn't happen. So, again, I'll show you here what native uh, cloud tools do. So, here you've got kind of someone working in their space. And Harry Hornbill here, in this case, is just basically showing me there's new stuff available. I can look on YouTube, I can write it. But anyway, that's where the notifications will actually appear. On the community, we just let customers know here there's new stuff. Um, do you want to have a look at that? We tell them what's in it. But you can just go to your own instance. So, in this case, we'll just log on to the App Store. And um, what that will do once I've signed in is just show me all of the applications that are installed on my particular instance so I can install, uninstall. I mean, literally, that's what it takes. Um, so here, the one we're interested in, Hornbill Service Manager. So we click on that. And then it will tell me what's new, what's changed, what's been fixed. So if I decide that that's something I want to do and give to my um, agents, I just basically go update. And that's it, it kicks off. It'll take about 20 or 30 seconds to actually do this, but literally that's all that's involved. So if someone else is spending their weekend uh, doing upgrades and stuff, I'm going to book myself on a trip to Amsterdam. <laughs> that's probably the best thing that I could do. Um, so we, yeah, we'll just go in here. Harry Hornbill will have done his thing probably by now, just about. Uh, so there we go, that's it, it's installed. And literally it is that simple. That's all you got to do. Now, you'll get your notifications coming up saying, here's the new stuff um, that we've just deployed. Um, and you can basically use feedback to send that back to the, to, to the vendor and just say, there you go, I completed my upgrade. Uh, I like this, I didn't like that. And actually, um, for cloud native SaaS vendors, um, most of them will be directly reacting on that. I mean, it's something we do all the time. Um, we do it through our forums. Um, so, the point I'd want to make here is that actually this is not just a benefit to the service desk and you know the fact that you can receive all of these updates and stuff without too much hassle, that it's always up to date, there's no upgrade pains. It's actually a great benefit to the vendor as well. So this is just a, a slide that we showed at our annual uh, customer uh, insights thing last year. And during that year, we did 665 updates, 50 new features, 20 new process designer options, and all of those went out to customers without any real effort on their part. What that means for us is that almost all our development resources are focused on adding new stuff and not having to fix things. So um, a lot of that comes through the forums. Uh, our customers just tell us what they're looking at and, uh, and we push stuff out because of that. I mean, Darren, you've been involved at the forums, you know what that's like. Yeah, so out of those 14,000 plus forum posts, I has probably about 20% of those are from Vinci. Um, <laughs> we're on there all the time, but what, like, like Pat says though, it's um, particularly with the new tools, such as when Project Manager came along, um, it gave us a really good opportunity to be able to interact directly with the developers um, from Hornbill, talk about new features, why we would like them included. And then sometimes we would have those features or bug fixes even within the next week. Sometimes you might have to wait a bit longer, but I think what's really good is just being able to have access and know that you're actually proactively helping build the system along with the other customers and they can help meet the demands. And in particular, things like iBridge, which allows us to connect with other cloud services. And it's very easy for us to just say, okay, we've got another cloud system over here, for example, whether it's text messaging, um, can we set up a feature within iBridge that allows us to send 
text messages via our other cloud system from Hornbill. And it's really easy and for us to just be able to have that kind of open communication um, at the developer level, but also at the customer level is actually really, really good value for us. I think one of the things that's just kind of community stuff, one of the things that's key to me is that we'll see posts going on to our community from time to time, and we got loads of customers jumping in to help people before we can even get to it. I mean, that to me is one of the biggest benefits of that community. Right, so um, I just wanted to flash this up here a moment because uh, we were talking earlier about the difficulty demonstrating value and stuff like that. And of course, we got ITIL 4, which was uh, released in February of last year. Can't believe it's been over a year now. Um, but the key things for me was this service value system, service value chain, and also the seven guiding principles. Now, they were there before. So um, when I say that, ITIL 3, uh, or 2011, whatever you want to call it, was released, and it didn't really have an overarching set of principles. So, Kaimar and um, Barclay and a couple of very solid people actually put together the ITIL Practitioner book, which was nine guiding principles, and actually last now, with their collaboration with uh, some of the users have brought this back and said actually it's slimmed it down to seven. So, a lot of the stuff we're talking about here today, keeping things simple and practical, optimizing and automating, progressing iteratively with feedback, collaborating, promoting visibility, focus on value, thinking more holistically. This to me is where it's at. So if you do nothing else, take these seven guiding principles and put them up on the wall in your office. Trust me, that's, that's kind of what you want to focus on. So let me just... Uh, move on a slide. I want to get back to here. So we're talking about co-creation of value. And for me, this is a major problem in that we tend to spend nearly all our efforts and our resources on this. Now, before we had IT service management and best practice, you had all sorts of unplanned change happening and stuff like that. So we're in a mess. So there's no question that IT service management and ITIL have helped us improve the quality and the output of our work. But the problem is that you implement some of the basics, incident problem change, you know, service request, a uh, little bit of configuration management, whatever it is, and, and that gives you fantastic results. So what most people do is they just keep investing. But the problem is that the more effort, the more time you put in, you quickly get to that point of diminishing returns. So basically, you're not giving the same level of return for the amount of effort you invest. So ideally, you want to stop somewhere after that point of diminishing returns, or as close to it as you can. And really look around you and take what you've learned from IT service management um, and apply it to other parts of your organization where your customers are, are, are really struggling, your colleagues are really struggling. Um, I'll, I'll give you some examples because we're seeing it all the time now. Pretty much, I'd say every deployment we do now has kind of, we want to automate stuff for marketing, for HR, for complaints, for finance, all of these various different service areas. Um, I will bring Darren on this in a little bit later because these guys are proper champions of enterprise service management. But if we just take one example here, because I just want to work through this really quickly, the HR thing. So if you can take your ideas, the stuff that you've got, and bring that to your teams, it's really going to make a massive difference to them. So here's the type of thing you'll typically get HR uh, teams suffering from. So recruitment process, really long-winded, huge number of policy documents that nobody reads on the internet. Uh, you've got to fill in papers, send emails, and you know managers recruiting really struggle to do that. So they don't follow the processes. They're not giving HR the information it needs to progress their requests. Um, and HR are buried with email. They're tracking everything to do with spreadsheets and stuff like that. And they're hand cranking all the reports. So they don't really know where the problems are or how it can be improved. And for me, big deja vu. These are problems we, we solved a long time ago. And we're keeping all that goodness to ourselves. So... This, I think, is where we say enterprise service management. Uh, our CEO, Jerry, coined the phrase, it's the biggest opportunity for IT since IT. So I just want to give you a sense of how this might look from a HR perspective. So we got a, a recruiting manager coming into the service portal, uh, and they just log into the service portal and say, I'm looking to recruit someone uh, into my position. So instead of kind of going through the IT stuff, they just go straight to the people services, manage my talent and say, actually, I want to recruit a new employee. So this is 
just some basic information they fill out. So they're looking for a new senior engineer for their new portal. When do they want them to start? What's the title? And what's the salary? Because that will drive some decisions, attach a job description. And then once we've done that, that's ready to go now. We've seen this thing before, um, but the service request is in. So you get all the kind of confirmation, what needs to happen. So this is the customer looking at that. There's the questions, the attachments are there as well. So it's a fairly straightforward few clicks and, and that's done. But now let's look at it from another perspective. So let's look at it from the perspective of the lady Sue, who's going to be managing this. So she'll come into her kind of workspace and uh, there's a news feed. So she'll go into a request list, more like what we normally have to see. And there's my request for a, a new headcount. So literally she goes into a request and says, uh, it's automatically assigned to the talent acquisition team. She can see the questions and any attachments, all of that stuff. Um, but it's assigned to the talent acquisition team automatically. Sue says, right, I'll deal with this and clicks assign. And once she does that, what will actually happen is uh, the tick box will be completed and now the next activity. So she needs approval from finance for the new headcount. So let's go back in and just complete that. So all I want to do is to move this on a little bit so you can see these activities being completed. So now budget's been approved. So the next activity is to just advertise the role on the website. Um, once that's been done and completed, um, that activity will move on and as tasks get assigned to these individuals, all of these things will start getting just just done. So here are the interview process to select the candidates and now the, the candidates being identified, they make an offer, remove the job from the website and it moves to the onboarding stage where IT gets informed of what's actually going on. Um, and that to me is just a simple, straightforward kind of process that's fairly easy to manage that you could do with your existing tool. So if you're not leveraging this type of stuff, you're missing a trick. Um, so Waltham Forest Council or London Borough Waltham Forest are a, a customer of ours and they kind of took on this HR stuff a little while ago. Here are some of the stats after six months of deploying the HR solution, just uh, increased employee satisfaction by 22%, dissatisfaction down by 29%, time taken to recruit reduced by 36%, I believe it's closer to 50 now, uh, nearly half the amount of information duplication and three quarter reduction on the number of forms needed to recruit. So, and these are just comments from people involved in the recruitment process. Now, as you can imagine, IT actually introducing this has done them no harm whatsoever. I did uh, with the lady who, um, Sam Eaton, the lady who actually headed this and drove all of these improvements, I did do a white paper with her or a smart guide or whatever we call it. Uh, the download link is there. If that's something you're looking to tackle, there's some fantastic information in there about how you might go about it. So let's get on to this. 2020 priorities. Um, Scarlett mentioned at the start, um, self-service I think is a big one, automation, integration. So let's just take that example, the onboarding. So here we'll just run through this very quickly again. It'll just take seconds to complete. So it's not the same request as you may well imagine, but this is just saying this is who's starting, a development guy is starting and the development team, click finish, and there we are, we're back to kind of the stuff that needs to be done. Now, typically what you do is you create accounts for them and you do that manually. And then you say, well, actually I want to try create their Office 365 account and set up their mailbox and do all these bits and pieces. All of these take minutes to complete. But when you're doing them hundreds or even thousands of times over a course of a year, that time really adds up quite quickly. So how might you be able to get rid of this? So this is just the business process designer. So we go into our account creation node and we say, actually, what we want to do is just integrate. The yellow ones are integration points. So all we do here is we just choose the integration connector, uh, Hornby Library or HP or Microsoft or whatever it is. And then once we go into the integration connector, we'll say, right, actually, it's a Microsoft integration. It's Office 365, users of mailboxes. And what I want to do is I want to create a user with a mailbox and hit apply. Once I've done that, all the parameters, there's no code or anything, they're all set. So that's the last time I will ever have to manually add a, add a mailbox. But we can take it further. So we can go in, we'll say, create their dev environment, connecting, we'll say, to AWS or something like that to spin up a piece of, a piece of kit for them, install Chrome, install all the other stuff. Literally, what happens here is now, once it's assigned and someone said, yep, that's okay, 
in the background, all of these various integrations will kick off and just start doing stuff. You can carry on and do your other work, and it will inform you at the end of it to say, hey, this has now been done. Um, if you can get a robotic arm to deliver the, uh, <laughs> to deliver the kit to their desk, then you've really cracked it. Um, so to me, that does make sense. Automation is the way forward. And really what you're looking for is that level of simplicity in terms of how you integrate things. If you've got to write code, then it's probably not the best solution going forward and you're, you're going to run into problems. Uh, sorry, that's playing again. So let me just move on beyond that. Ah, there we go. So I did a podcast with a, a customer a while ago, um, Mark Littlefair from BTG. And it was called Stop Fearing Automation, Start Driving. It was a session he delivered at our insights thing last year and what he's basically saying is they're saving thousands of hours each year by just do, automating stuff like this that i know it no longer needs to touch but the big point there is that actually he's saying that we all that automation is very visible to the customer and they can see we're adding value so it is looking a whole lot better and as he said we're a partner that's enabling the business to work effectively as effectively as it can. And actually, this to me is the key point in terms of delivering and showing your value. When the business is doing something, they want IT to be involved. So if you can help them address their problems, the enterprise service management piece I talked about, they're gonna ask you to get involved in things and view IT very differently. So Darren, I wanna come back to you here and talk about some of the stuff that you've done because um, you've won awards for this, uh, an internal award, I think a company award for innovation, correct? Yeah, we did. So um, annually we have uh, an innovation award within Vinci and it's broken down to different categories. Uh, and um, we successfully submitted a, a proposal for our project, which was to uh, automate and um, improve the project management system within IT and how it delivers value to the business. So it was very much around how we delivered project manager, but it also around from a technical point of view, some of the automation we put in around how we interact with our end users. So um, via the service portal, the business were able to now interact with our project management team by submitting project requests um, and ideas for innovation themselves. So we want the business to innovate. We want them to come to us with ideas um, and we want to be able to help facilitate those ideas kind of becoming a reality. So our project work, the way we implemented this project um, was actually recognized by the, the board that um, provide the awards for the innovation. And we came to off our group in the, the process and project um, category. So when people submit a project into us, um, it comes through via the approval board. Uh, we review it, we understand how it aligns to the business objectives. We're essentially four different businesses as well within Vinci, all of which have their own strategies and tactics for the year. Um, and we have to map the projects out to those, understand how they'll deliver value. And then once we've gone through our approval process, we actually automate the, the projects that are then generated. And we have a standard set of small, medium and large projects. And depending on what project is selected, it generates different activities, different budgets, different resources. So it actually really kind of streamed out, streamlines that whole process for us. And we're using Hornbow iBridge in the background to actually do all the hard work for us. Then, as I've mentioned before, we actually use Power BI for our reporting. So now we have a project dashboard where we talk about the resources, the value, the budget. Are we on track? Are we not? Um, are there any delays that are kind of coming in that we might need to be aware of? We also use it to manage our risks. So using the risk management functionality within Project Manager allows us to kind of present these things at a high level straight to the business. And we run these uh, fortnightly scrums and output from that we can get a stakeholder report to the key people in our projects it's in the business whether it's about budget schedule change whatever it might be we can get that to them on a fortnightly basis we were unable to do that before yeah and one of the um, things i think one of the things that was most impressive for me is what you're doing with your enterprise service management thing um you're using the boards we showed earlier to track opportunities to basically solve problems for other teams yeah, absolutely. So um, the whole enterprise service management is something we've been driving now for the last couple of years. Um, and the business have kind of finally kind of tweaked on to what it actually means for them, as opposed to it being an IT thing. It's actually nice as a business opportunity here. And we're using global boards within 
Hornbill to manage not only the new opportunities, also to manage those projects, especially as once a team has been onboarded into Hornbill, um, we often find that they just want to keep going faster. And what that's doing is it's generating lots more opportunities, whether it's new processes, new forms, and being able to keep track of all of that activity, as well as the opportunities of new teams um, using the boards is actually brilliant. It means I can go to our to the, the head of IT and digital, as well as all the business leads and say, okay, we've got these projects, this is where it kind of fits. And then we can look at opportunities for collaboration as well. So things like the new starter process for us has been one that we've been focusing on. And now we've got all of the teams, which is IT, HR, and our fleet department on service manager. We're now able to really address that as one process rather than three individual processes. Ultimately, that's gonna speed up the way we onboard people into our business. And that's adding value back into the business. It's not about IT or HR, it's about adding the value back into the business. They can have staff operational a lot quicker, more streamlined, they understand where the process is. And that's basically just gonna make life a little bit better for everybody. Right, okay. Um, I did have a little uh, video here, which uh, I'm sure Scarlett will be able to share later on. I'm not gonna bother now because I'm just conscious of time. Um, and I'm conscious of the fact that people are still maybe want to ask questions. So um, I'll just pause it at that, and um, I, I assume that we'll be able to share some of this content in any event. It'll be as, as recorded as a webinar, of course, you can listen to it whenever you want. Scarlett, have we got any questions yeah. coming in? Yeah, we've got, uh, we've got a couple, and um, thank you for stopping early we are nearing nearing an hour um, so I'll I'll uh, just pick a couple of questions uh, but first of all I'd like to say thank you uh, both Pat and Darren there were some really great insights in that presentation and I feel like people can get a lot of a lot of value from that um, so first off we have a question um, it says Darren talked about uh, getting the right information for the service desk to start working on instance right away. How do you prioritize yeah. fast instant creation for end users versus better instance for service desk stuff? Oh, right, okay. I'm not sure I fully understand the question. Um, so the way we work with the the, the prioritizing and, and the workloads within, within our team is so, um, all of our services we break up via a tier. So we have essentially a tiering system. So anything that's business critical ends up with a tier one, anything that's like a single point solution, um, Adobe Reader or something like that, we have at a low tier, tier three. Um, and then as the tickets come in, depending on how many people they're impacting, they get their own priority based on the tier and the impact. So we apply that same grading no matter how the ticket comes in. So whether the ticket comes in via self-service, email, a phone call, or even someone just walking in, um, we always apply that same priority level, uh, the same priority grading, should I say, the matrix to it. So that as things are coming in, they're automatically getting the right grading and then they kind of sit accordingly, whether it's to the right team or just prioritize for each of the service desk analysts in the right order. So not sure if that answered the question fully. It was about priorities, I think. Um, and hopefully that kind of gives a bit of a clue in terms of how we do it within Vinci. I think what the um, question was trying to get at was, um how do you make it fast and easy for end users to log a log an incident while also getting enough information for the service desk yeah so i think there's um so there's two elements it's not all just about the questions we ask um what we what we've done is a lot of work around actually trying to communicate about why we're asking the questions and i think that then goes back to being able to support that with reporting so for example being able to illustrate to someone the amount of time it takes to log a ticket and complete a ticket when it's logged via email compared to how long it takes when you log it via the self-service and so what we were able to draw was there kind of really easy comparisons around if you log it via email in general it takes twice as long than if you log the same ticket type via the portal because we're able to ask the right questions and we get the ticket assigned to the right people so what we're then able to do is really just communicate that out and it's about trying to educate people around the value of actually doing it right first time via the uh, the portal. Um, they might feel like it takes them a little bit longer, the initial upfront, but if you're able to demonstrate that actually on average, you're gonna save two to three days every time doing it via the portal and compared by email, they soon realize the value. And once they've done that a couple of times, it makes it a really easy sell for them because they just, now we're getting asked more and more about why is this not on the portal yet? 
because we can't actually keep up with the demand of people saying, oh, I had to do this, I had to do that. And they can understand that actually if they do it via the portal, then it generally is a lot quicker. Um, and now we're getting chased to say, can this be made on the portal rather than us sort of trying to chase it for them. Okay, interesting. So it's it's sort of like helping them understand using perspective and things like that. Yes, I think, absolutely. I think, and I think that's, yeah. So I, I think the other aspect sorry, is that, so, sorry, Darren, I didn't mean to cut across you. Uh, the other aspect there is, if you look at that kind of coming in via the portal, what you need to do is to have a proper understanding of your services. Not only that, but what questions do people ask? What are common problem types, et cetera? So this is what we were showing earlier, this concept of progressive capture. So when you go in and say, I have a problem with my VPN, VPN connection, well, what are the possible outcomes of that? And once you can actually click on whichever one you want, it actually drives them in the right direction. So the more you hone in, on the problem, uh, the, the easier it is to just basically automatically assign it with all the questions and answers already given to the right team first time. Yeah, and just, just to add on to that is language. Um, actually, to make these things usable, you've got to think about the language and not speak about from an IT perspective. So everything that we go through, um, we remove any kind of IT reference as best as we can, remove all the acronyms, all of those kind of things to just make it feel simple. And we really try and phrase things and use the terminology that the biz would use, not what IT would use. I think when getting your services and your questions right, you really do have to think about the user experience and kind of how they phrase things compared to how we would phrase it ourselves if we were having a chat in IT about something. Yeah. Okay, great. I think we have time for one more question. Um, we've got one. It's not something that uh, we've really spoken about uh, today, um, but it says, uh, do you have any thoughts on using chatbots and AI? So like pros and cons for that solution? Can, can, I, can I step in with that one to begin with? I think in the majority of cases, um, AI is seriously overhyped. I think chatbots can probably help. Um, so if you're um, you're dealing with huge volumes of calls and you basically want to deflect some of those away, chatbots can help without a shadow of a doubt. But the key point being that in order for that to help, you need to understand your services. You need to understand the questions that people will ask. There's no magic within this stuff. Um, you, you do still have to think about that. And the stuff that we were going through earlier with, you know, that connection refuse and that type of thing, if someone can do that via a portal and you've thought about the questions you want to ask, ask your customer and the answers that you're likely to give, then you've done 90% of the work that, you know, you're looking at from a chatbot perspective. So I think... If you're, um, a couple of our customers got chatbots on their websites and stuff, um, and they're asking things like a council saying, when's my Bing collection day? It's fantastic for stuff like that. But once you get into the depth of things, uh, you need a huge amount of data to actually make it meaningful. You need to constantly review uh, what's happening with that data. And if you put the same effort to designing your services up front in the portal, I think you probably find that most of that can be done without having to play with AI. <laughs> Yeah, and so we we haven't deployed AI or chatbots um, ourselves. And like Patrick sort of says, we've really tried to get make sure we're doing things right on the portal. The one area though that we have looked at with Hornbull and and we did kind of work on some iBridge connections around this was we did use the idea of um, using sentiment analysis. So that's a common AI theme that's kind of banded around, and whether we could use sentiment analysis on our tickets to determine if the mood of a customer or the quality of a ticket was good or bad. Yeah. And so there are some things that I think, you know, we've kind of got a few of those ideas in our sort of development ideas. Um, so there are opportunities where you could use it, but I don't think it's going to um, be in the same area that people think it would be, which is around resolution. We're actually looking at about how it can improve the quality of our service um, around tickets and kind of mood of users. Is this person disgruntled? Does this ticket need to be escalated because of the tone of what their update was or something like that? Um, but we, we aren't using chatbots or anything. Okay, thank you so much for that. Um, I, Pat, I couldn't agree more with you that um, AI is getting to a point where it's overhyped. Um, yeah. There's a lot of foundations that you need to get right, which take a lot of resources themselves. Um, and if anyone is coming to our uh, to SDI 20, our conference, that is actually a topic I will be speaking a little bit more about. Um, so please feel free to, to uh, come along if you're interested in hearing me rant. Um, but 
other than that, I think that is all we have time for today. I know we have a few more questions from the audience, uh, but if it's all right, I think I will send those to uh, Pat and Darren uh, separately and get their answers and, and send them privately as well. No problem at all. Yeah, fantastic. Yeah, no problem at all. Okay, fantastic. Thank you so much for today. It's been really great having you here. Thanks, Scarlett. It was a pleasure. And thank, thank you, to Scarlett. Everyone. Thank you. Thanks to everyone for listening today as well. Thank you. Have a great day. Take care. Bye-bye. Thank you.